Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. And today's game up on the tabletop is Ultimate Voyage Final Quest of the Treasure Fleet. It's a one to four player game, takes roughly 60 to 120 minutes to play, a big game, and it's for ages 14 and up. And in the game, you're taking part in the final voyage of the Mang China's tributary system. You're going to be working with an Admiral Zhang He, uh, and he's going to be partaking with you the voyage as well. And you'll be uh, crossing around uh, in the past trying to accomplish the uh, tributary roles. Uh, you'll be utilizing your ship or ships to move from location to location to gather trade goods and gain prestige, um, while of course trying to secure additional locations such as like little posts. You'll be working on the porcelain board, which is going to help you create the temple, and accomplishing goals along the way. This is a large game that involves a lot of options, a lot of different choices as far as your, your actions go, and your actions will simultaneously change and power based on how you choose to use them and where they're positioned on your board. You're going to have dials that will be changed as well in the game that will give you bonus action points. You're going to be utilizing soldiers and you're going to be utilizing vases to accomplish your missions as trade goods. And of course, the game will end in a variety of different ways. Either the track here is going to hit six for a short game or nine for a long one. Uh, one player is going to hit on the prestige and trade board 15 points so simultaneously. Uh, Zen he will pass away by hitting the final space on the game board as well as other different uh, wins I like uh, having a number of the uh, objective markers objective objective cards that you control and game throughout the game anyway uh, whoever has the most points on one of these boards here at the end the, the, the lowest of the two will be the winner uh, as well as you'll actually gain additional victory points throughout which we'll talk about anyway let's go ahead and get into the game the setup for the game how to play and of course my review. To begin setup for the game Ultimate Voyage, Final Quest of the Treasure Fleet, the first thing you do is you take the main game board out and place it within reach of all players in the middle of the table. From there, decide how many players you're playing with, because that determines how the board will be set up. Each player will get one unique character, such as the Navigator and the Diviner. I've set the game up for two players for this example, but I'll explain how it works for all players. And we'll start off with the main game board. The first thing you'll do is you'll place each person's prestige and trade markers on the zero space on these long tracks here. Additionally, you'll place markers on the spaces with the markers on them, one for each player, and it'll have unique backsides that will give you unique bonuses when you reach them throughout the game. Additionally, each player is going to have a cube or a marker that's going to indicate whether they're playing first or second that will change from round to round, most likely. Each player is also going to have their main ship start off in Nanjing, which is going to have that little plus two to this little like temple area here. You'll see it on the board in the top right hand side. If you're playing with less than four players, uh, or less than three even, depending on how many players you're playing with, you're going to actually place a marker of the player who's not playing in the game on each of the locations on the spaces in the continent that were selected to not be played in. And in this case, purple, green, and uh, orange are not going to be used. So I placed a orange cube on each of the circle square spaces on the game board. Additionally, you're then going to place trade goods in each of those square spaces that are being used. Based on the number on the left hand side, in this case it's four, you'll subtract the number of players who aren't playing the game and place the remaining squares on this space here. Four it says, only two players, place two. Three it says, only two players, uh, select just one. So in this case here, I've placed them on blue, red, uh, and these darker brown or lighter brown. Uh, and then I've also placed these cubes here. The cubes are actually going to be placed here as well based on the colors illustrated on the squares that have the little cubes here, which you're going to be utilizing to gather that give you more bonus actions throughout the game. Then you have the bottom left hand side, which is Zhang He. Zhang He is where, where you're going to be placing the Admiral uh, uh, on the white square on the far left hand side. And as you'll notice, the track will go continuously from white to black. And when it hits that black space with an illustrated red around it, that means that Zhang He passes away and the game will end that way. There's also the round tracker right underneath them, which will start at one and you'll place it actually on the uh, on the space left of the number. So it illustrates the round, then the space where the marker is going to be, which will also illustrate what is going to happen from round to round. Finally, you have the bottom area of the board, which is the storyboard. 
You're going to take away any of those trademarker squares that are not being used in the game. And in this case, like I said, it's like the orangish yellow, the green, and the purple. Just remove those. You're not utilizing them. And place all the rest of the trade goods underneath the square uh, storyboards of their color. And in this case, we have blue, red, and kind of this brown. Then the main game board is pretty much set up. Each player is then going to get action cards, which you'll be able to set up however you'd like from left to right, above or below your game board, your own player board. It's up to you really how you choose to set it up, but I suggest putting it above. Placing your trade, combat, sale, explore, and diplomacy cards in the order that you choose, and then giving each player a reference card. There's an end game trigger reference card, a trade good reference card, as well as at how to get certain prestige points and the unique actions that are gonna give you an idea of how the actions play out. Your main game board is going to be consisting of uh, five of these little uh, building areas, which you'll be utilizing mainly as trade areas on the board, which have little spaces on them to represent the different building spaces. Your cubes, which will be used for a variety of markers, including placing on the storyboard area. And then a number of resources. In this case here, it says that I start with five porcelain and I start with five armies uh, in these squares here in the middle of your game board as the navigator. You're also gonna get uh, these circular discs that you're gonna be placing down on their color as well, which will be ever-changing based on the die. The last thing you're going to be doing is you're gonna be setting up the objectives, which you'll shuffle each deck that have different colors and flipping over one to represent the different objectives you'll go for from round to round or situation to situation, as well as action cards or event cards, I should say. And you'll shuffle these guys, but you'll place them face down, as well as you're going to have the porcelain board. This is where at the end of the game, when you bring your ships back to Nanjing, you'll be building up this temple here and scoring points based on how well you build it up. Otherwise, set aside any other tokens you're not utilizing, wind markers, or even this little tornado that will uh, come onto the board at certain points during certain rounds, which will change how movement works for when you choose to sail. And everything else you do not need. Set the dice aside and start the game. It's fairly simple, but there is a lot of setup. All right, so how to play the game. Well, first of all, I'm not going to explain everything in detail because there's a lot of mechanical things you'll be doing for each of the different actions in the game, but I'll give you the basic round overview. I'll explain the start of round and the end of round and how the game plays out so that you'll get a good idea of the game. The first thing you're going to do is start the round. And when you start the round, you'll go through a number of things. The first thing you'll do is you'll move the mount, round marker one space to the right on this board here. And as you move them uh, on different spaces, based on the color of the space, will determine how the wind is gonna move and based on the area that you're at on the board. It'll tell you whether or not you have to roll certain die to either um, suffer poor Zhang He's life a little bit or um, the, the markers on these boards will move uh, in certain ways, either left or right. Uh, you'll resolve any events that appear in the next round space, which is what I just said, and then you'll determine the play order for the new round based on the positions on either the prestige or on the uh, profit track or trade track, which are these guys here. The person on the farther left will switch and change the position on who goes first in the game. So the tracks will determine player order. Uh, for any non-hostile ships with no affiliation, reduce the affiliation by one step. Uh, you're going to have affiliation on this board here as the game, as you like explore locations, which you'll set up with these brown or these gray cubes here. Uh, and basically when you walk through, you'll determine how hostile they are or how nice they are. And they can change in the game as you visit them. And you're trying to turn them into your kind of location. But otherwise, they can actually be hostile. And if you don't have a ship in that location uh, during the start of the round, uh, or there's just no ship period, then it's gonna actually go down. They're not happy because they're not getting trade goods. Uh, the first player will roll the three deity dice. These are the uh, red, green, and puke green dice. And based on these rolls, you're going to then um, assign them to your little discs here. So if I roll a two on the red, it'll be two. If I ever roll a negative, it'll just simply be the lowest value. And you'll place it on your game board accordingly with the number facing the bottom of your board so that you can utilize them whenever you take an action. Organize the action cards and any unused cards will go to the right. So your action cards, as you use them, you're going to actually move them. So occasionally throughout the game, uh, each, each turn, you're gonna flip over, or turn over one of these to the right, like magic and be tapping them and utilizing one of your discs. And so any used ones that you have will move over um, and you 
uh, and the ones the uh, ones that you haven't used will move over to the left, and the ones the ones you have used move over to the left, and the ones that you haven't used move to the right. Thusly, if you don't use an action now, later it will be more powerful, which will then untap them afterwards so that you now have access to all the actions, but the ones you previously didn't use will be a little bit more powerful. And then you'll gain a porcelain if you built a kiln, and you'll gain a troop if you built a training camp. And these are buildings that you can place on your player board, which will thusly give you more resources throughout the game. And after that, you're ready to begin. If you're playing the first round of the game, you'll skip all of these steps except for the start of the round, the start of the portion where you actually roll these dice here. But otherwise, you'll ignore, ignore all that and only do it on the rounds two all the way up to nine or six if you're playing a short game. Okay, so how does the game work? Well, it's played in turns. I'll take a turn, you'll take a turn. I'll take a turn, you'll take a turn. And we will consistently go from turn to turn up until we've used all three of our dials and three of the cards here. Once you've done that, then the round will end and you'll reset everything, and you'll start with the round overview, thusly continuing the game. So you're gonna have three turns per round, and you'll have up to six for a short game and nine for a long one, unless one of the victory conditions has been met. Somebody obtained enough objective cards, somebody reached both ends of these tracks here, the uh, Prophet and Prestige hitting 15, uh, the Poor Admiral passes away, so on and so forth. And so how now do we take a turn in the game? Well, we take a turn by taking actions, and there are five actions in the game. The first action that you can take is sail. Now, when you take an action, you'll have to determine how much strength you have for the action. And luckily, every action works the same way when it comes to gaining strength. Well, some of them might give you more strength by spending different types of resources, but otherwise it works the same. You'll check the position of the action you want to take on your board here from left to right, with the farther on the right being the stronger action and the farther on the left being weaker. One, two, three, four, and five respectively. So this, is, this sail action is on the far right. I'll turn this to the side and I will gain five strength. Additionally, I have to select a dial. There's three dials here I can select and based on what the rolls were at the start of the round will determine the number or strength value of the dial. So if I take this red one, which is a two, and this one is on the far right, which is a five, I'll have seven strength to utilize. Additionally, I can spend the porcelain and troops for the strength of the action as well. Depending on the action that I take will determine what I need in order to discard to gain more bonus strength. Like for instance, for sailing, I'll need both one porcelain and one troop in order to gain additional strength from the action. Otherwise, it'll be different for different actions. I'm not gonna explain all of them, but just to give you an idea that that's how it works. So I'm not gonna spend resources. I'm just gonna have seven strength by discarding the dial and turning this to the side. That's my first action. Sale says that basically when you travel from location to location, and you'll see it by the little arrows on the game board, uh, it's gonna cost you a number of movement points. And based on where the track is and whether or not there's uh, some disturbance in the water, there's gonna be a, a larger cost. It could go from one half a point, one half a point of strength from one location to another, all the way up to like three points. It really just depends. And you'll move your ship based on the number of strength and how much you have available to you in the different regions here. And then we'll get to a location. So in this case, we'll just say it's one, uh, three points to get there, okay? And I've moved now to Malacca. After that, I'm then going to roll this die here. And when I roll the die, I'll determine the affiliation of the location. So like how hostile it is to me, or if it's a chill location. I roll the die and it pops at a two. I'll then take one of these gray cubes and place it on the affiliation on two. And from there, then I'll get to take and draw an encounter card or the action cards in the game, whatever you'd like to call them. Basically, you'll draw one of these cards here with the ship on it and you will do what it says. Uh, if, however, the location is actually negative two, it's actually a hostile location and you'll actually have to fight it. But in any, in any other circum circumstance, you're just gonna simply draw a card. If an action is upgraded, you'll be moving multiple ships, which I'll explain that in a little bit. But basically, if you have to, if you move across multiple different regions, for each region you move across, these are these white lines here uh, that separate the different colored regions, you'll get to draw a card for each ship, and then you can select which one of these encounter cards you'd like to use. 
Uh, and then after that, you'll finish up your turn and pass the next player. You'll leave the card where it's at in the order, and you'll turn it to the side, illustrating you've used it, and you'll have removed the dial. Any extra strength that you do not utilize is simply lost. Okay, let's talk about the next action. The next action you can take is the trade action, and the trade actions will allow you to gain market goods from the different locations that your ships are currently at. There is going to be a required amount of strength, which you will gain the same way as the previous action. You'll turn it to the side based on where it is in its location on the board here, and you'll gain that strength plus one of your dials here. And you can take these icons here. Now, another thing I didn't mention for the sale action is when you reach a location, as long as it's not hostile, you actually flip over this little token here, which will illustrate a trade good. Trade goods require a certain number of strength in the top left-hand corner for the trade action. It'll tell you whether or not you get storybook points for them, and it'll tell you whether or not you move the prestige, profit, track, or if you gain wild knowledge. Spend your strength to gather one of the tokens, place the token on your board. There's a variety of different ways at the end of the game that will score you bonus points for having these guys here, as well as a points that you will gain uh, from these tracks here. Obviously, this is one of the ways of victory condition is hitting these say, trade and uh, prestige tracks here. So gaining these is very important. But yeah, you'll be able to select one utilizing the strength and equipping it to your board. The next action you will take is Diplomacy, which is going to be based on the affiliation track of the location that you're at. Some of these guys might not be as high as you'd like them, and you'd like to get them to the top portion of the track, because then they become yours. And the way that works is you're going to use the required strength you've, you've gained against the port's strength. Each strength of each port is based on these knowledge cubes and how many there are total spaces for that location. So Malacca, for instance, has two cube spaces, thusly the port strength is two. So if I have five strength and it has a strength of two, then I minus that and I get three. And I'm going to increase or decrease the port's affiliation based on the strength differentiation. So in this case, I can move this up three spaces. Then I'm gonna gain plus one prestige for each space I move it up on the track. And in this case, it would be three. So I would move it three spaces. If the port becomes tributary, and there's only one that way that happens, is if the um, marker moves all the way up to the top here, I'll remove this cube and I'll place one of my own. Thusly, now they are tributary to me, and I am going to gain uh, story points, and it's going to be based on the port's strength. And in this case, it's a two, so it's a smaller one, so I'll gain one story point in the region on the board where the location is. And in this case, it is going to be the mainland Southeast Asia. I'll place my marker down there on the top left-hand corner. That's where it starts. If you ever place a new cube, it'll be in the next space. And uh, no one is ever going to share a space, so if you ever move up, you're simply going to jump over players' cubes. And this is the way in which I'm going to gain story points, additional prestige, and the location will become mine. Remember, like I explained, too, at the beginning of every round, if you don't have a ship in that location, you're going to kind of lose your tributary. It'll go down. And eventually, if it gets down to the lowest end, it'll become hostile once again, and you're going to lose out on having it be in your kind of control. Uh, additionally, there are also these encounter cards that you will draw that may have you diplomacy against them. And it works fairly the same way. It's your strength. Um, strength required is greater than the strength of the card, a plus the die, and if you do, you win. And you actually gain story points for succeeding in these ventures. Fourth action is combat and construction. And the way combat works is similar. Just like the other ones, it requires strength. You'll take your card, you'll turn it to the side, add the bonus of strength, add a dial, and then you'll check your opponent's strength plus a die roll, the absolute die roll, and determine if you win. So for instance, if I'm fighting Malacca for any reason, uh, that is a strength of two. I'll take this 10-sided die and I will roll it. And regardless of if it's two or negative two, the strength will be two. So I'll add two plus two and that will be four. And if I win, so I have to have higher than four strength, then I'm going to gain a bonus, and it's based on my opponent's strength. One and two is one story point, th uh, three and four is two, et cetera, et cetera. I'll take a marker or a cube and place it in the story area of that location. Uh, and if it's versa port, uh, I'm actually going to make the tributary become three, and I will gain control of it. And I'll also get uh, two points in either my trade or prestige trackers. I'll actually move these across if I succeed. If you lose, then you're going to lose porcelain or you're going to lose armies. And if you don't have either of those, you'll actually lose prestige points on this track here. Additionally, with, cons with construction being an extra action you can take or the other action, you can spend 
four points per building that you like to build. And you can either build them on the location that you're at in the space of the building. And if there's already one there, you can't have another one. Or you can build a uh, kiln or a like training camp that will allow you to gain bonus resources every round, one per one. So if I have one kiln, I will gain one porcelain vase. Um, and it also just reminds you on the card what the things do and at what point they do them at. So it depends on really what you want, whether you want more affiliation in the different ports areas or you want more resources throughout the game, then that's where you, will, where you can build. And the fact that you can do both actions simultaneously is nice. The last action, but not least, is Explore. And how Explore works is there's a number of strength that's gonna be required in order to gain these knowledge cubes on the spaces here. And if the port has already been explored, it'll cost an extra one strength. Basically, when you add up all your strength, you'll check the chart on this card here, and based on your strength is how many cubes you can take. Oh, you have seven strength? You can take three cubes. Additionally, you're also getting a bonus of story points too, based on the number of knowledge cubes you've acquired. In this case here, if I gain three, I can gain one story point. Finally, you're actually going to take one of your cubes and place it down below in the storyboard areas where there are little icons based on the icon of the location. So Malacca here has this kind of long temple. You'll take your cube and place it on that long temple in the mainland South Asia, South East Southeast Asia location here on that long temple, illustrating that that place has now been explored. And thus they will require more strength the next time somebody comes to take knowledge cubes. What do you do with these knowledge cubes? Well, on the bottom of the card it explains, and it says, if you don't have, if you have three that are not the same color, you'll be able to gain a bonus. You'll take one of these cards here, uh, these, and you'll hide it, and it's a card that you can then utilize like as a bonus victory point condition. Three that are the same color, you can upgrade one of your cards here, and upgrading your cards will allow you to utilize more ships uh, that, that work with this action together. And then a number of colors of the same, a number of cubes of the same color is gonna give you an action that you can utilize as a free action um, when you have played this action here based on the color. So if I have five green cubes, and I, after I have explored, I can actually make a free action with a strength of five. However, I don't get any of the bonuses or benefits of taking one of these markers here or spending resources. Uh, you're only gonna simply gain the benefit of the amount of strength you have based on your free action. And those are the five actions that you can take in the game. And after I've taken one of these actions, then my opponent takes one of these actions, we'll rinse and repeat until three of them in total have been chosen, in which case the end of the round will begin. And the end of the round is basically just the start of every round phase where you're gonna simply move the marker here, do any of the effects on the location, and also remember that that location has a color that will change how your ships move based on movement for traveling. Uh, you're gonna determine the player order for the round based on the tracks here. Uh, and odd and even will switch back and forth between trade and prestige. Then you're gonna check to see the non-hostile ports, as well as if there are any cubes missing, knowledge cubes, you will add one to the port area. Uh, you'll organize your action cards and then you can gain porcelain from your kilns and bases. And based on the player who starts the, rex, the round off is who starts and they go and simply take those three turns and go back and forth. Other things to note too is whenever you gain other additional tokens, you'll take them from the bottom of the game board like these uh, trade tokens here and place them on the board here. Whenever you gain any of these cubes, you'll take them from off of the game board. Whenever a location is not controlled by you, it's gonna be using one of those gray cubes. And additionally, whenever you gain one of these objectives, you're gonna then flip over a new one based on the player amount. So in a two player game, you're always gonna have, you'll have like three to start, but eventually it's just gonna be two that come back and forth. And in some cases you'll take one uh, or take multiple and choose one and have it sitting aside hidden. Like most respected for instance, which says claim this card when you have a higher amount of prestige than any other player at the end of the round. And you actually score victory points for doing so. So there's a variety of ways that you're gonna be gaining additional victory points in the game. Like I said, the game will end when one of the many different end game triggers happen, our general uh, admiral passes away, if somebody hits all of the highest points on the prestige and trade track, if we get to six or nine based on the round, based on how many, uh, like how long you want to play the game, a six is a short game and a nine is the longer one, or if a player has basically acquired a number of those objective cards. 
and that's how you play the game. We'll get into a few more details here when I cover in my review, but I think I'll give you a little bit of an idea about how the basics of it work. There's other things like when you basically, when you get your character to Nanjing, one of your ships here, you'll be actually able to build this porcelain uh, tower here, and that can score you additional victory points as well. But yeah, there's quite a bit, but I think you have the kind of the idea and flow and structure of the game now. Okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of the game. And the first thing is like end game scoring and all that. Well, getting your ships actually to the end here in Nanjing will let you remove your ships from the game. Your stronger ship will give you more value and your smaller ships will give you less, but you'll be adding victory points for doing so. You're also gonna get victory points for your tracks here. If you have two tracks, one's at 15 and one's at 10, you're gonna get 10 points. For each objective card you've managed to complete and finish, flipping it up and putting it next to your game board, you'll score the top right hand side, which is also gonna give you victory points. The storyboard is also a way you will score victory points. Based on how far you are in the track here, there's a maximum amount of points that you can gain, but you'll gain up to six points and um, as low as one point if you're on the board. And you can only gain points based on how far you've gotten. If I'm at four and Callie is at two, and our, our victory point area here is the six, three, one, the max I get is four and the max she can get is two. Um, because that's as far as that we are, we don't actually gain first and second. And you add up all those points, and whoever has the most points when one of the triggers has happened is the winner of the game. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in the game too that I didn't even cover because there's so much. Like you can actually review, you can actually upgrade these cards here. And that's when you turn in your knowledge cubes, you turn these cards over, your action cards, and that will allow you to actually utilize more ships uh, with the card as opposed to just one. Additionally, flipping over these cards is gonna allow you to upgrade them, and there are upgrade markers in the game uh, that you'll play, so like little plus ones with a little arrow, and that is going to simulate a bonus one strength for whatever card it is that you're utilizing as an action. Uh, additionally, there's more. The, each of the different characters here uh, have unique classes, and not only unique starting things that you'll gain, but also unique abilities. Like the navigator is actually gonna start with a plus one strength to the sail action. So the navigator will move a little faster than everybody else. Whereas the diviner is going to, after the die have been rolled to determine the dials here at the start of the round, they can actually re-roll one and select whether or not they're gonna use the new one or whether or uh, not they're, they're gonna use the original one and whether or not players use, like which die the players are gonna use when, with the re-roll. So they can have a little bit of control as to the strength, giving themselves a little bit of a bonus in comparison to other people. And there are other characters that do other things. Uh, there is a, num uh, like an, uh, a numerous amount of different little guys here, and these guys will actually score you points as well. There could be ways where you can collect them, the little animals to score you points if you have a number of them that are different. Uh, there are going to be certain market tokens that are gonna score you storybook points. They could be more expensive in strength or cheaper, and there's a certain number of them allowed. Some of them are gonna just let you move up on these tracks here. Like for instance, this little horn here costs six strength. No storyboard, but you do get to move on the tray track three spaces for gaining it. And your objective is to basically go and campaign. You're trying to create like tributary trade routes along Ming, uh, the Ming Dynasty in China and going around and gathering the different locations, trade valuables, having to deal with dissenters that are not kind of working along with you. And while there is interaction with players as far as how the board works, like if I go to a certain location and gain control of it or place a building there, it prevents other players from doing so, taking an objective that players are going for, there's no like take that in this game. I'm not gonna be really affecting you so much as I am going to be manipulating the game board to determine how more difficult it might be for you to gain the values that you need. And of course, we are all going for unique objectives. So while we're not officially, technically, going head to head against each other with actions or fighting or any of that kind of stuff, we are basically going against each other with trying to gain the valuable commodities, objectives, and resources throughout the game moving along the board. There's also a lot of technical details when it comes to movement based on moving over a line, uh, specifically what way you're moving and what color the arrow is, uh, whether or not there's anything like this little, um, 
That's like a, it's like a, what is a, is a water tornado. I don't know what it's called, monsoon. Uh, but that, that'll affect your movement spaces in various areas. Each portion of the game board is gonna have different locations based on the color, as well as the two different portions of the C, which is where you'll use that marker, will determine um, whether or not it's gonna be more difficult for you to move through there. The storyboards are really relevant as to how far you can get along, along them, to score additional points. And of course, utilizing them is gonna be very, very beneficial, as well as whenever you can pick up one of those objectives and simply gain it as points is excellent. There's almost no reason not to do it. You might be in the, um, the camp of you're winning right now and so you want to kind of push a victory condition along or an end of game condition along uh, to try and stop other players who are doing the slow roll. There's a bit of engine building this game. You're going to be making different things like the training camps and the kilns here that will allow you to gain more resources throughout the game. Uh, there's some of the things you can't really have any affiliation with, whether it be the round or the be Zheng He just kind of uh, passing away before his, his time and thusly ending the game. You want your Admiral to stay alive if you want the game to continue. Uh, the game board is smaller with lower number of players, so it's a little bit more condensed, but there's still plenty of locations to visit, there's plenty of things to do, and the game starts to roll as you start to get into it. Like, this game is mechanical in a lot of ways, uh, having to say, I mean, it's pretty simple. After you go through all the beginning phase steps, then you're going to go through and pick an action, utilize it, and gain your strength from it. And all the actions, while straightforward and simple, uh, do have a lot of variety based on the location that you're at, what, locate, what action you need to take next, and you have to also think about things in the future. Really, it's, that's probably the most important thing in this game is actually kind of contemplating what you do now, which is gonna affect you later, and there are small random elements that can change that based on the movement in the water and whether or not you have to deal with any turbulence. But in general, it's all about planning ahead, securing locations, gaining valuable resources, completing the storybook, completing the objectives, and moving your tracks along throughout the game. You don't have to just do one thing. You can do many things, but you want to kind of pick and choose. Maybe I'll focus on objectives and my tracks here. Maybe I want to focus on the storyboard and my track, or I'll focus on gaining these cubes to give me bonus actions and worry about pushing my track. And so you have a lot of wiggle room, while it being a fairly simple game with five actions that you can choose, along with, of course, combat and construction being attached to itself. The ability to upgrade these if you want with just a simple plus one also allows you to utilize multiple ships. And in fact, there are ways in which you'll gain multiple ships in the game. A lot of them being when you reach certain portions on the tracks here, you'll flip over one of these tokens and gain the benefit. Is it an upgrade for a card or a plus one? Or are you going to get a bonus ship that you can now place down in the, one of the ports that you're at or one of the ports that you control that allow you to move around? Uh, multiple ships are not super powerful. It's not like the same thing as gaining an extra meeple in a worker placement game, but they're very useful. They basically allow you to have more control around the board. They protect your locations from dropping down to the point where they basically become neutral. And so it's very useful to have multiple ships and being able to go back and turn them in to increase the porcelain tower at the end of the game and score additional victory points is something to definitely consider. The artwork for the game is excellent. Uh, while there's a lot of stuff going on on this game board, it's very fairly busy. Uh, most people, modern gamers that have played some thicker Euros, some pickup and delivery resource management games, it's not going to be very extremely difficult for you to understand. Each location is a space. Each space has a region. Each, each of these different spaces in the region are going to have a name, a strength, trade goods, and affiliation, as well as your little cubes here, knowledge cubes that you can gain to spend for action points. It tells you at the start of every round how to you what, what you're going to do as far as um, like the administration of it all. And each space, while there's a complicated list, is fully detailed so that you straight up understand it. Uh, I would like to see, hopefully they have that as a, another card that affiliates the like the start of the round, uh, what each action does. There's some that kind of explain it pretty well, like how to scout. Uh, your trade goods and how many there are, as well as your end of game triggers and how to get certain things like profit, prestige, and story points. But it'd be nice to include another one that just kind of illustrates the, the, the full round in, in like a text way, as well as the basics of each of the actions. I mean, I guess these are kind of, these work as, um, as kind of explanations as well as to what they do. Maybe it just was a little, I mean, now it doesn't bother me. It's easy to under, after I got through the first few rounds, um, 
yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm changing my mind on that. But uh, something to illustrate the beginning of the round other than just kind of symbols would help me, me a little bit more, uh, especially for the first portion. But nevertheless, like I figured this game out after the first three rounds, and I, that's where I started getting into it. And once you get into this game, there is a wide variety of things that you can do. It's colorful. It's beautifully illustrated. Everything is kind of spaced out and explained where it goes. You see the chunks on a board, which is so important as opposed to a splash. Splash is always nasty, and this has chunks labeled, defined, and what they do, where they go. And of course, just the beautiful illustrations. Quality. Now, I don't know if this is the full product, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is because it is excellent quality. Every marker is unique. The different colors separate themselves. The two different specific resources are easy to use and easy to understand. And the dials, along with their strength and how you use the cards moving them around, is fairly simple, not super complex. And if you've played any of these games before, this is one that you can jump into and understand as long as you follow the steps. It is a more complicated game. The board space, board presence is rather large, and there can be a lot of things that appear to be going on in the game if you kind of just jump into it. And you have to really, you really want to know the game a little bit before you just kind of throw yourself in and learn how to play. Because if you're, if you're not experienced, but if you are, it shouldn't be super big. Um, I love the aspect of the dice as well, the way you can manipulate them. Almost everything that's a little bit luck based in this game is manipulatable that's a word and it just works really well the flow of the game felt good and it was a lot of fun as long as you don't mind a game that's a little bit mechanical big space and a little bit heavy on the heavier side then i think ultimate voyage is one you should definitely take a look at i like this game this is a game i would back and so hopefully that helps you determine whether or not it's right for you thank you guys for watching our unfiltered gamer board game review for the game ultimate voyage final quest of the treasure fleet if this is a game that is right for you go ahead and take a look at the campaign the uh, link down below in the description will take you where you can pick up the game or a way to at least uh, check it out and be ready for it when it does pop. Uh, you can also go and check out our live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST where we play games just like this one in fact from the lightest of games to the most complex of games there uh, and we're doing it for every Sunday for a long time. You can also check out our whatnot streams. We usually do them on Thursdays. Uh, and of course, if you would like, you can check out our website, unfiltergamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, kisser, lists, and more. Please, if you've watched our videos before and you appreciate the content we create, consider subscribing. And if you want to go with the extra effort, go ahead and hit the bell notification button as well. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to venturing out in the Ming Dynasty with you next time.